Today we are continuing our series called Pray Like This. Uh, we are looking at the, the Lord's Prayer, and if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to go to Luke chapter 7 if you want to get a head start. I read out of the New Living Translation. Uh, use whatever translation you want. If you have a Bible app, uh, a great Bible app is Version. So if you're new to the Scriptures, you don't know anything about the Scriptures, I just encourage you right now to uh, just uh, dive in with us today and, and learn something new. We're all in this together. Come on, turn to somebody in your gathering tell them, we're all in this together. We're all going to learn together. And so the Lord's Prayer, we, we've been talking about this the last few weeks because starting 2021, what better way to start it than with prayer? It's why we're doing 21 days of prayer and fasting. We believe in the power of prayer here at Core Church, and we believe that prayer changes our lives. And last year, if, you are, if you're just joining us, this is your first week, I've been sharing each week that this series is really birthed out of my own prayer life. Last year, I began praying the Lord's Prayer. I'd always heard the Lord's Prayer, but I'd always seen it as kind of this ritualistic thing that we did. We just kind of set it together, and it didn't hold a lot of high value and meaning like it should. And last year, God led me to begin praying the Lord's Prayer every single day and opening it up and, and looking at the different aspects of it and spending time in it. And what I discovered was how beautiful this prayer is, how the depth of this prayer and, and really how relational this prayer is, that when you begin to pray this, it's not a ritual, it's about relationship. And because it absolutely transformed my prayer life in 2020, I thought, I want to I get this out to everybody because I really think this can help you. In fact, when you go to the 21 days of prayer and fasting on our website, you're going to see the Lord's Prayer guide there. That's actually the one that I use, and if it would be helpful to you, I encourage you to look at that and begin just using that as a, as a pattern for your prayer. Today, uh, I want us to talk about this idea, though, in the middle of the prayer, we're going to talk about repentance and restoration. In the prayer, Jesus talks about uh, forgiveness. So let, let's, let's say the Lord's Prayer together, okay? If, if you, uh, wherever you are, wherever you're gathered, we'll put it on the screen for you and, and so you can see it. And, and let's say it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So that's the prayer that we're, we're talking about that you, I'm sure, are familiar with. And so today, we're going to be looking at the part of the prayer, forgiveness, repentance, and restoration. And this part of the prayer has been the most meaningful to me personally and the most transforming to me personally, and I hope it does the same for you in the few minutes that we have together. So I want us to look at a story of forgiveness in Scripture of Jesus' life. Every week in this series, we've been looking at the life of Jesus, and in Luke chapter 7, we see repentance and restoration in a story that is told in verse 36. It's a little bit longer story, but let's read it together because of the value and the depth and the beauty of this story. We really need to hear the whole thing. It says this, one of the Pharisees this guy's name was Simon. He asked Jesus to have dinner with him, so Jesus went to his home and he sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from the city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet and she wiped them with her hair. Now that seems odd and strange to us, but in that day, in that custom to wash someone's feet, and, and to wash them even with your hair, that's what servants would do. If they didn't have a towel, they would actually let down their hair and, and they would wash feet with their hair. So it wasn't odd or unusual for this woman to be doing this, but for her to kiss his feet, that was, uh, that was just a, a humbling moment. Again, not odd in that culture, but just they recognized, well, how desperate she was. And she began putting perfume on his feet. All of this is very foreign to us, but not in this culture. This is, these are things that they would have seen these practices, recognized these practices, the respect that she was showing to Jesus, we know as the Messiah, they looked upon at this time as, as a Jewish rabbi and how she was respecting him. But it says this, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Then Jesus answered him and said, Simon, 
uh, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon said, and, uh, or Simon says, insert your own joke there. Then Jesus told this story. He said, a man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one, 50 pieces to the other, but neither of them could pay him back. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling the debts. And he says, who do you suppose uh, loved him more after that? And Simon said, well, I mean, the one who canceled the, the larger, the debt, um, one got the larger debt canceled. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and he said to Simon, <laughs> this is just an embarrassing moment for Simon. Hey, look at this woman kneeling here. Like when I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she's washed them with her tears and she's wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she's not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she's anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. Love is displayed through forgiveness. If you want to show somebody you love them, forgive them and, and ask for forgiveness. That is how, dis, how love is displayed. But a person who has forgiven little shows only a little love. And he turns to the woman, he says, your sins are forgiven. Then the men at the table said, who is this man that goes around forgiving sins? We know who he is. He's the son of God. He's the Messiah, the chosen one. He's the one who forgives our sins. Wherever you are, give a collective amen. In the chat is a good time right now to say amen. And Jesus said this to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Father, in the moments that we have together, would you just speak? Speak to us. Would you show us through your word what you want to say? And would you help us to live lives of repentance and restoration in Jesus' name? And wherever you are, in your gathering, say amen. Well, I, I know the entire time that I've been talking and reading scripture, you are asking yourself, probably asking in your neighborhood gathering, what in the world is our pastor wearing today? What does does like does he think like that is like cool? Like, I mean, is that is is that is, is that in style? Like, is it in style? Because like I know ripped jeans are in style, but are ripped shirts in style? I, I, I know, that's what you're thinking. <laughs> you're like, I, is that cool? Is it not cool? I can tell you that it doesn't matter because what I'm wearing is my favorite shirt. This is my all-time favorite shirt. I, I love this shirt. Every guy has a favorite shirt. Every guy. You got a favorite shirt. Come on, guys. But every woman in every guy's life hates his favorite shirt because he won't get rid of it. Like, I've had this shirt for, you ready for this, over 20 years. But whenever I put it on, it just feels like a part of me. It feels good. But I can tell you, over the course of 20 years, one thing I haven't noticed is how much it has faded. The reason Laura doesn't like it is because it's got massive holes everywhere on it. It doesn't matter. It is, it is all jacked up. And everybody who sees this shirt knows it, but I'm, I'm comfortable. I like my shirt. I, 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 in fact, actually, I thought maybe I'll just get it sewn up. I can get this sewn up. I can get it, I can get it repaired. This is, it's it's kind of like an adult baby blanket to me. It just, it just feels good. Sin operates the same way in our lives. Sin is a slow Fade. You might want to write that down. Sin is a slow fade. And it is easy to get comfortable in our sin, where we don't even notice the holes that are appearing in our soul. Everybody else around us notices, but we don't notice the slow fade and the hole that is that the hole that is developing in our soul. This is why in the middle of the Lord's prayer, Jesus said this, pray like this. Forgive us our trespasses. In other words, forgive us our sins. I want to tell you this is the most impactful part of the Lord's prayer in 2020 for me. Cuz I had neglected repentance in my own life. Now, here's the thing. There was no glaring sin in my life. There was nothing big that I needed to repent of. And, and, and every once in a while, I, something would happen. I would mm, say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing. I might think the wrong thing. But, and I would say, man, I need, to, I need to do better. But to be honest with you, I've been following Jesus for over three decades. I'm a pastor. And, 
And I was had this almost arrogance, I think, that said, like, what do I, I don't really need to do that every day. Like, I, I mean, come on. Come on. And what I recognized in my own life is as I began to practice repentance in my own life, every single day I discovered the beauty of repentance. I discovered a depth and an intimacy and a love with God that I had not known before. Well, what I recognized was I was, I was Simon <laughs> in the story. When Jesus was really calling me to, to be the woman at his feet. And I believe that Jesus is calling all of us, all of us together, to be the woman at his feet every single day. Look back at the story. It says in verse 37, let's look at this woman. When a, when a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt beside him at his feet, weeping, like her tears fell at his feet and she wiped them with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. Like this is what the woman's life looked like, this. And everybody knew it. But guess what? She knew it too. Like she knew how broken she was. That's why she's coming weeping in repentance to Jesus because she hears about Jesus. Think about this. She, she hears that, that Jesus is in town and, and she's heard, this is, this is the guy that I think, I heard he has the power to, to forgive sin. I, I heard that, that he heals people. And, and so she's like, I, I gotta go see him. I, and she takes this huge risk because she's like, maybe, maybe, just maybe he, Maybe that, that'll bring the, the joy back in my life, the freedom back. Maybe, he, maybe he'll forgive me. And she takes this risk. And it's a huge risk, by the way, because she's, she's an immoral woman and she goes into the home of a Pharisee, a religious leader. She has no business being in that home. They could easily just say, do not come in here. And then she goes and she touches the feet of the rabbi, of Jesus. You don't, listen, in that culture, in that time period, you don't touch the holy one. You don't touch the rabbi if you are an immoral person. But she's like, I've got to get to Jesus. Maybe Maybe you can relate to that. I think a lot of us can. Do you remember that moment for you? I remember mine. I mean, where you just recognized your brokenness and how just jacked up and messed up your life was, and you thought, okay, maybe, maybe just maybe Jesus will forgive me. And you took a risk and you went to church. You remember that moment where you just stepped into the house of God and you're like, okay, and I hope lightning doesn't strike me. And then you remember asking for forgiveness Remember that moment and how beautiful that was? That's this woman in this moment. You gotta wonder what led to this moment in this woman's life. Was she, was she like reflecting the night before and maybe, maybe a man had just left her bed? And she's just reflecting man after man after man. and oh, She's just seeing how she's just being used and abused and taken advantage of and just tossed around like a piece of trash and and in that moment, she just kind of thinks, maybe, just maybe if I go to Jesus, and she's just tired. I'd like for you to write this down, because here is what repentance is, and here's how we come to repentance in our lives. The first thing is this, repentance begins with reflection. Write that down. Repentance begins with reflection. Let me ask you this. When was the last time you reflected on the state of your soul? When was the last time you reflected on your sin? When was the last time you reflected and took a deep inward look? Now, I know when I say that, you're probably like, wait, wait a second. I mean, I, I, yes, I, Brad, yes, I did that like, like years ago. I mean, I, I asked Jesus to forgive me. He came into my heart. I, I stamped my ticket to, to heaven. Am I, am I missing something? Last week, uh, we were talking about uh, Luke and Celeste and how they got married, and we showed their engagement picture. And Laura was joking around about our engagement picture uh, in fact, I've got a copy of that. I found it, and it's it's a, not a very good copy, but uh, this is our engagement picture. Now, when you see this picture, it <laughs> it, it looks like a, a picture from like I don't know uh, 
uh, from the 1940s or something like that. I mean, it's just it's that it looks that old, but it's not really that old. It's just a grainy um, photocopy. It's the best best I could find. But when you look at that picture, we look really happy, don't we? I mean, we look really happy. I mean, it's like look at them happy couple. No, we weren't. It wasn't. We weren't. We weren't happy. We weren't happy at all. <laughs> in fact, we'd had one of our biggest fights ever. And to this day, after 36 years of marriage, we were married in 1984, by the way. That's the year. Happy 80s. And, and when we got, at that time where we got engaged, that is the worst fight we, I think, one of the worst fights we've ever had in 36 years of marriage. So much so when we got to take the photograph, because you go for the appointment, and he's like, okay, you know, get in there tight, look at each other, smile, okay, and she just looks, she's like, don't touch me, do not touch me, and she was really ticked, and I can tell you this, as a man, I, I said, will you forgive me, because here's, here's what I know about women, women and Jesus have two things in common, number one, they've, they've never ever done anything wrong, and number two, uh, everybody's always let's go to them to ask forgiveness, that's what every guy understands, okay, so, <laughs> Come on now, you know I'm not lying on that one. That's, that is the truth. Uh, but it, it, I want to tell you this, though. That is not the last time I had to ask Laura to forgive me. What's made our relationship healthy and strong, what, what has brought us together in love, as I said earlier, is that love is forgiveness and forgiving is, is love. Is that because I've asked her forgiveness and at times she's asked for my forgiveness, we have grown together in love. And in the Lord's Prayer, what Jesus is trying to say here is that repentance is not a one-time thing. Repentance is an all-the-time thing. Come on, turn to somebody in your neighborhood gathering and tell them, repentance is an all-the-time thing thing. Repentance is an all the time thing. It's, it's daily reflecting, daily looking at my, my life. Not, not looking for glaring big sins. You know, it's like, it's like this shirt. Can I tell you this? Like this hole right here, that did not develop overnight. That happened over time. At one point, it was a smaller hole like one of these. And if I had taken care of it when it was like this, it wouldn't look like that. Okay. That's what you and I need to do. When we come before God every single day, we, we look at those things in our lives that don't become larger things that will destroy us, but we take care of it. It doesn't mean we go digging for something that's not there. That's not what I'm saying. Like you just all day, every day, on your face, crying out to God. That's not what I'm saying there. I'm saying that, but every day I'm thinking about my thoughts. Like in the last 24, yesterday, God, was there anything that I was thinking about Anything I had my mind on that was not pleasing to you. I mean, your words, think about your words, just reflecting on your words. What did I say to the people around me? What did I, what did I say about other people? What did I post online? What did I say? Was there anything, God, that was demeaning? Was there anything I said that was out of line and not with your character? It's about looking at your actions, you know. God, was there anything that I did? that didn't please you, that doesn't line up with who Jesus is, and, and just sitting in that for a moment and letting the last 24 hours and letting God just kind of reflecting on that and allowing God to speak to you and to show you those areas in your life. That happens through reflection, and this was something Simon had not done in a long time because he was a religious leader and he didn't think he needed to. Verse 39, it says, when the Pharisee, this is Simon, who had invited him, saw this, the woman coming into the house, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. Come on, say it with me, what? She's a sinner. Like, have you ever gotten food on your teeth and you didn't know it? You know what I'm talking about? Like, and then later, you're like, you looked and you saw it and you were like, horrified, like, how long has that been right there? Like, why didn't somebody say, this happened to Nick Jonas, I don't know if you saw the Grammys, but he just got blew up all over social media because he had food in his teeth, and man, everybody was talking about it, and he kind of laughed it off, but what's crazy is he had an assistant that saw it before he went on stage and didn't say anything to him, but guess what, Nick Jonas didn't know. I, man, I, this is why, like, you may not know this, but before I ever come on, we backstage, we have a mirror, and I go, I, and I look in that mirror, and I look at my collar, I look at my, my, my pants, and my pants, are they hanging over my shoes right, because I, people look at that, yeah, don't, come on, you know you do. I look at my teeth, I'm like, do I have anything in my teeth, and I'm just, I'm, I'm checking out all of these things, and I, probably some of you right now go, you got a mirror backstage? 
you wouldn't believe what we have backstage. I've got a masseuse backstage. I've got a personal chef backstage. I've got a stylist back there. i got a hot tub backstage. Come on, somebody. Every preacher needs a hot I don't have any of those things. i got a mirror, just so I can check. Listen, what we need to be doing every day is kind of looking in the mirror. It's so easy to see the sins and the faults of others and not see our own. Come on, that's happening in our nation right now. Everybody's doing it. We're all guilty. Turn to somebody and say, we're all guilty. We are. What, what do we do? Look at what they're doing. Can you believe they're doing that? They're wrong. I'm right. We are. This is where we are as a nation. Like, I, I'm, I'm right. Nobody is doing any kind of, of reflection or, as I would say, write this down, repentance requires recognition. It's not enough that you reflect. But repentance requires recognition. In other words, recognizing and coming to grips, not with somebody else's sin and faults, but coming to grips with my own. The prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament, he said this in Isaiah 64, 6. We are, say it with me, what? All. We are all infected and impure with sin. Come on, turn to somebody there in your gathering and say, he talking about you. He's talking about you. When we, he says, when we display our righteous deeds, they are, say it with me, nothing but filthy rags. In other words, we are all sinners. Now turn back to that person in your gathering and say, he's talking about me. He's talking about me. We are all sinners, but we don't all recognize our sin. Simon didn't recognize his own sin. He looked at his life and didn't realize that he didn't look any different than the woman. He had on the, the religious garb, he had on the, the, the robe and the jewels and the, the tassels, but he did not look any different than the woman. He didn't even know that he didn't look different. Why? Because he was a religious leader and he thought, I'll perform these religious rituals and God will see that I'm good. You know, core church, we have eight core practices, eight, eight of them. In fact, we'll put them on the screen. You, you can see these eight core practices, and, and whether it's, uh, you know, sharing Christ or Sunday worship or daily devotions. These are the eight things that help us to grow healthy and strong in our relationship with Jesus. And it, I'd like for us, just for a moment in your gathering, here's what I'd like for you to do. Share with one another, may, which one of these you'd say, I'm doing pretty good at this one, and I'm not doing so good with this one. Just take 30 seconds. I want you to share with somebody in your group. Shout out to Alex Trebek. A little tribute moment there for that man. Hey, when our, when our soul is infected with sin, it, it doesn't matter what practice you put into place. To God, it looks like filthy rags. We do this all the time. Like, oh, I'm going to come on Sunday, and whew, or I'm, I'm going to read my Bible, and, and, and it's kind of the great cover-up. And I'm, I'm going to look the part, and I'm going to do the right thing. But you got to realize, you think you look good to everybody around you, but to God, he's like, no, nah, that's not what I'm looking for. So a while back, I, I heard this banging outside of the house, on the side of the house. I just heard this. And I was like, what in the world is that? And so I go outside and I look and there's a woodpecker beating the snot out of the side of my fireplace. And he is, he is beating this hole right into the side of it. And I, of course, being the craftsman and the handyman that I am, <laughs> I, I went to the shed, I found an old piece of plywood, got out my, my screwdriver and I screwed up a piece of wood. Like here, I took a picture of it so you can see it. Like this, this, is, this is my repair job. Yeah, <laughs> Not so great, is it? But that's exactly what it looks like when we perform religious, religious rituals. Like, it's great that you are practicing the eight core practices. They help you grow healthy and strong in your relationship with Jesus. But guess what? When you are using that and that's, you're not coming before God in repentance, it's no different than just covering up a hole. Right behind it, there's this glaring hole in your soul. And Jesus looks at it like, 
filthy rags. That's, that's not what I'm looking for. And so it's through daily reflection that the Holy Spirit helps us to recognize that we've been covering things up, helps us to recognize those things that we need to repent of. Look with me at verse 48. It says, then Jesus said to the woman, say it with me, your sins are forgiven. Write this down. Repentance brings restoration. Repentance brings restorations. I, restoration. I think these are the four most powerful words. Your sins are forgiven. Turn to somebody in your gathering. Look at them and say this. Your sins are forgiven. Man, like this woman, when we come before God and we confess our sins, he says over us, your sins are forgiven. I can't imagine this moment for this woman. She thinks about all of her despair, all of her brokenness and her disappointment, and Jesus says, I, I forgive you. That's what restoration is. Restoration is God saying to you, I don't reject you. I forgive you. I don't hate you. I love you. There, in fact, listen, it's not, I'm not going to push you out the door. I'm going to welcome you in. You, you actually have a seat at the table. Like he's saying to this woman, Simon, you want her out of your home, but I guess what? I'm going to give her a place at the table. In, in verse 50, Jesus says this again to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in what? Come on, somebody. Peace. In other words, listen, you don't go in pieces. You go in peace. When, when you ask God to forgive you of your sin, he doesn't just sew up the holes. No, 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 no. He takes that sin and that shame and that brokenness and he gets rid of it. He takes it out of your life. Again, the prophet Isaiah said it this way. He gives a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Like, Think about that. This is what God, what God wants to do for you today. He wants to remove your sin. He wants to remove your despair. Like where you would look down, you would say, holy smokes, this ain't me anymore. This is me now. And you're like, how is that even possible? It's possible because of the cross. It's possible because this man, Jesus, the religious leaders who said, who is he? He is the Messiah. He is the son of God. It's like this old hymn. I can't help but think about the old hymn that says, what can wash away my sin? Nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What, what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Man, oh, precious is the flow that made me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. You, my friend, today, God wants you to come to him in repentance, and he desires to restore you today.